for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Tom Barnes, uh, and I am Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Enterprise here at uh, the University of Greenwich. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, for me tonight to give a very brief introduction uh, for you uh, to this lecture, which is going to be given by uh, Professor Keith Tomlins. Uh, Keith is a professor of food science at the Natural Resources Institute, and I probably don't need to tell you about the work of the Natural Resources Institute, because I see you're probably all more expert than I am, but I'm sure that you are well aware that it makes a seminal contribution uh, to many aspects of uh, development uh, in the developing world, and it's actually one of the jewels in uh, our crown of uh, research here um, at our university. Um, I first became aware of the work of Keith when I, uh, shortly after I joined here, I think it was about 2008, Keith, I'm not quite sure, I came in here to get a Mars bar at the cafe, and I was accosted by Keith and his team who asked me to test something which was much nicer, that was um, a mince pie. In fact, it's still mince pie, it was even better. I didn't need me to buy the Mars bar. Um, and I think if you were testing those Mars bars, if I recall, for Witch magazine at that time, um, and it was at that time that I became uh, personally uh, very well aware of the work that uh, Keith uh, uh, was doing, has been doing, uh, on uh, food acceptance testing and began to become aware of uh, the body of work that he's done, particularly in developing countries, that have led to some really very specialised knowledge and capability uh, in that area. Keith's work, of course, is much more than testing mince pies for Witch magazine. He works with partners in the UK, Netherlands, France, Portugal, Nigeria, Ghana, Uganda, Malawi, Tasmania, Thailand, Vietnam, and the list goes on and on. And that list in itself actually will give you an idea of the international reach of Keith's work and indeed the work of NRI. I think it's quite fair to say that, I was going to say in an indirect way, but actually I think I could say in a direct way, that uh, Keith's work has had a, a key influence on nutritional outcomes in developing countries. You will know as well as I do that the cultural acceptability of various different kinds of foodstuffs <coughs> has a direct influence on what people eat, how much of it they eat, um, how much uh, nutrition they get, and then through that, substantial effects on things like health and well-being. And uh, Keith's work, uh, and the work of his colleagues in this field, has been a key contributor uh, to uh, the mitigations on uh, uh, poor nutrition, which have been called for as part of the UN Development Goals. And it's been particularly important for people on low incomes, very low incomes in developing countries. Uh, but Keith's work has also involved other key contributions to the work of NRI, and in particular uh, to the work of NRI in uh, food security and uh, food uh, safety. He's uh, made some rather important contributions in the field of uh, post-harvest losses, uh, particularly uh, around um, actually food stuff that I love, which is the orange flesh sweet potato. You sweep a lot of those in New Zealand, actually. Uh, and, um, uh, and he's going to tell us, actually, about an electronic sweet potato. I didn't realise that such a thing existed. I would recommend that you bite on it. You can probably stimulate its shock sensor into paroxysms if you do, but we're going to uh, actually hear a little about that. Uh, but more importantly, that work on the electronic sweet potato was all about the handling of staple raw materials, which are actually con key inputs uh, to uh, the food supply chain. Uh, and in the early part of his career, amongst other things, uh, Keith has worked on uh, mycotoxins, uh, their detection and analysis, and through this, again, has contributed very directly uh, to uh, <coughs> food safety technologies. Keith studied food science and nutrition at the University of Surrey. Uh, he joined the then Tropical Products Institute in 1982, which I remember is just as if it was yesterday. 
Uh, he moved to the University of Portsmouth, where he was a research assistant working on mycotoxins again in 1986, and he joined NRI, I was going to say as we know it, I think probably more or less as we know it, uh, in uh, 1987. Uh, since then, he's done a two-year stint working in Malawi. Uh, in 2012, he became president of the International Society for Root Crops, a society that spans uh, over 30 countries across the world. He is the author of a very impressive, more than 100 publications, and probably even more impressive for those of you uh, who uh, for those of us who, like me, are not that keen on travelling, he's done over 120 overseas assignments for NRI to a multitude of countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, South America and the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very privileged to have Professor Keith Tomlins talk to us this evening. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for everybody uh, coming, um, and uh, thank you, Tom, for that uh, very kind introduction, which is very much appreciated. I don't, I don't quite, I don't quite think I recognise the same person that <laughs> I'm delighted to uh, contribute to the work here. Um, so, as I said, everybody, thank you very much for coming. We've actually got some guests. I want to just uh, mention. Actually, we mentioned the University of Surrey and Professor Mike Clifford. He was my um, tutor at university. I'm very privileged to, at the University of Surrey, very privileged to have you today. I've also got a couple of guests who've actually come a little bit further than some of them. They've actually um, come here from Washington. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, they're also, by luckily for me, attending um, a conference here, but uh, we're delighted to um, have you here. So um, thank you very much for coming. So on that note, um, I think I now would like to uh, start my presentation. And um, the topic of the uh, presentation is um, let them eat cake, uh, food quality and sex and acceptance in Africa. Um, what I want to try and do at the beginning is give you some guidance to how the presentation can be laid out, or the structure, so we're going to have an introduction. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about this uh, electronic uh, sweet potato, and as Tom says, I wouldn't recommend eating it. Um, and then we're going to talk about the main topic, which is actually uh, sensory and uh, consumer acceptance of foods in developing countries. And after that, what I'm going to look at whether I've actually made any impact on development, I hope. Um, and also, perhaps we can talk a bit about the uh, future. And, and also, then, we'll round that up with some um, overall conclusions. So let's make a start. Let them eat cake. The question is, who said this and why? <coughs> I've actually put some pictures on there which might give you a clue. Well, it's reportedly said by one of the queens of France. And uh, the king at the time was Louis XVI. And of course, that is uh, Marie Antoinette. Um, and she was actually vilified for saying let them eat cake, because the context was supposedly that there was a, a famine in France, people were starving, and she said, let them eat cake. Or, as you can see, there's an example of the cake there, um, Kilmond de la Bouche, which is, or Brioche, which is um, a bit like a cake. <coughs> but the question we ask ourselves is, was she actually right in saying what she said? And what I think is that actually we can attach a, a, a different interpretation to what she said in terms of let them eat cake. And I think that actually we should eat cake and that poor people have got the same right to access to food that is safe, 
acceptable and nutritious to rich people. And therefore, and that's what the premise is that I am actually um, proposing today as part of this lecture. Because obviously we at the Natural Resources Institute work predominantly in developing countries. <clears throat> but the challenges are really quite enormous. Um, you know, population globally is expected to grow to 9.3 billion by 2050. And most of this growth is probably going to take, in, take place in urban populations. And if that is so, then we need to have systems that are going to support this. And so, we then lead on to the question, well, why is acceptance and equality important? Well, I suppose you can say that our very survival depends on access to nutritious foods that are safe to eat and so acceptable. <coughs> one of the things that um, one of my lecturers in nutrition and dietetics at the University of Surrey kept on um, saying was food not eaten because of poor quality and acceptability has zero nutritional value. And as an undergraduate many years ago, I actually remembered that. <laughs> and, and I think it's very important. <coughs> but of course, um, if you look at the um, focus of research, um, most of the research actually in food has been in, in producing more food to ensure there's enough to eat. And this is rightly so. But I'm saying that food acceptability for poor people um, with minimal education, in fact, has actually been neglected in many areas of research and development. So one of the things that we're trying to do now is to correct this. And so we have to again ask ourselves another question, which is, does acceptance matter? Well, the first thing to remember is actually not all um, new food products which are marketed are actually a success. And in fact, if we look at, uh, although we don't have any information for the developing countries, in the USA, up to 72% of new products are not a success. And if you take products which are not new, but just similar to existing ones, then the success rate is about 50%. So, again, it's very important that we meet this uh, challenge in developing countries, and particularly where resources and funding are scarce. If we can provide better information about acceptability and quality, then I think we're doing very well. <clears throat> and also, another advantage of this is that it helps us to give um, better access to new markets for these foods, um, give people better access to more nutritious foods. And the other thing is that we can help improve income, livelihoods, and food security. <clears throat> and I have to say another thing here, which is a mantra I do say when we're talking about food acceptance, is that um, you can promote a new product and its price um, all you like. You can tell people how nutritious it is. But if that food is not acceptable, then you will not drive repeat consumption and repeat purchasing. And that's absolutely important to um, understand that. So on that, I'd now like to talk about the first of the sort of subject areas, which is our um, electronic sweet potato. <clears throat> and this was uh, developed a few years ago because we had, a fund, we had funding from the Department for International Development, or DFID, which is the UK um, government uh, support for international development. And um, why did we do this? Well, sweet potato is a traditional crop for um, subsistence farmers in Tanzania. But it is increasingly being marketed 
and um, trade it. But what you tend to find is that with many of these crops is that the infrastructure is not very well developed, so there are quite um, substantial losses in the system. <coughs> and to make things worse, um, the sacks are transported not on weight but just by size. So when traders buy a sack, they want to buy one that's as big as it possibly can be. And what this means is that in the Tanzanian system and many other African countries, this sacks can get quite heavy. And 100 kgs is possible. We've seen 250 kgs. Although the problem then is I've never had scales big enough for me to go further than that. And these sacks are transported quite long distances. But the problem is there's no easy way to monitor them when you're working overseas. You know, how do you follow the sack? And the problem is you're following them, then people don't behave in the way that you think because they know they they're being watched. Hence the development of this uh, electronic sweet potato, which we made from off-the-shelf components, <coughs> which are very cheap to buy. So let's have a look at this scenario. In, in the middle of the uh, picture, you can see the, the electronic sweet potato. Um, and the yellow block there is a shock sensor, which we attached in a plastic pipe. It's about the same size as a sweet potato. And we also <coughs> attached in there two sensors, one to measure temperature and one to measure the humidity. So this told us what was going on inside the sweet potato. And so what happens, here's our sweet potato. And as you can see, it's got a very large head to the sack. As I said, they want to make it as big as possible. And this one's so big, it's taking, it requires four people to carry it. I, I, couldn't even, I can't even make them move when they're on the ground. <clears throat> and so we, we actually locate our electronic sweet potato in the middle of the sack. And then the sack loaded onto a truck or lorry. And you can see the lorry is filled to the top with all these sacks. And then when it gets to its destination, it then undergoes more handling. And as you can see, this chap or porter is actually carrying a single sack on his own. And at the market, um, then there's further abuse uh, in the sense that people sit on them, walk on them, all sorts of things. Not very good for our um, sweet potatoes. So, now, now we come to a little bit of the um, science here, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep the graphs to the minimum. What you have here is a graph on the left hand side, vertically, it measures the impact as measured by the sensor. And on the right hand side, it says drop height we calibrated the sensors to the height of drop of the sweet potato sacks. Along the bottom um, horizontal axis, we have time. Now, as you can see, at the very beginning of the first hour, there's a lot of activity when the sacks handled on the farm and dropped a few times. It's then loaded on the uh, truck and it's transported for about eight or nine hours, and you can see all the activity then. Then the activity stops while um, overnight and uh, finally the following day there's more um, handling at the market. So what we did is we had traces for lots and lots of different sacks which were transported um, to the markets. <coughs> so what we now did is we actually developed a model um, it's what us scientists like to do and in this case we related it to injury to the sweet potato versus what the um, sensors were recording. And this one here shows, um, for example, in its skinning injury, which is injury to the surface of the root. And that's quite important because if the root is injured, then rotting organisms can enter the root and, and cause losses that way. And one of the problems is, is, is the roots are too badly damaged, they're not very well at healing themselves and recovering from the situation. 
And anyway, we found similar trends for braking as well. So what we were able to do was to track our consignments of sweet potato over long distances unmanned, provided we the market to retrieve them. We managed to develop a model, and then having shown our results to the uh, traders in the market, we were actually able to get them on some of the markets to reduce the, the sack size or weight to 100 kilograms. Not, not as much as I would like, but we're going in the right direction. Okay, <coughs> um, I now want to change the subject again, <coughs> away from the sweet potato, and now I want to move the subject onto the main topic, which is uh, sensory evaluation and consumer acceptance of foods. Now, there's two pictures there, <coughs> and they're up there for a reason. The, the left-hand side, we're talking about sensory evaluation. And that is where we use a small number of trained experts in a controlled environment who are going to assess the food product. So they're going to look at its taste, odour, appearance, and texture in quite detail for us. <clears throat> On the right-hand side, we have another picture which shows a different way we can do it, which is actually we ask people how much they like a product or how accepted it is. And there, we go out of the laboratory and we go to where our consumers are. And in our case, this is in a village hall in Uganda. No electricity, I think no running water. But you can get mobile phone connections, though. Eh? <laughs> That's all changed. Okay, now, I'm going to have a little change here. Um, and a kind of an experiment. It's about acceptability. And um, there's two reasons I'm doing this. Is one, we can measure acceptability here, but I can't, I can't give you all food samples. And, and also the other reason is that my youngest son is not able to make it today because he's studying music at Brighton. <coughs> he's got an exam today. And I think also he might be uh, playing some music tonight at a gig. So I thought, well, let's bring the gig here. And then I'm going to ask you some questions afterwards, if you don't mind. <coughs> so let's see what happens. I hope they let the volume right. So there's some of his music he's written and composed, and he's also singing. Okay, 
So what do we mean by um, sensory evaluation and consumer acceptance? Well, what we really mean by this is that we're using our senses, looking at odour, appearance, taste, temperature, tactile, even pain. Um, and what we're doing is we're applying um, scientific methodology in some way to either measure the sensory properties of a product or its acceptability. We want to do this in a reproducible way so that we can get statistical results which we can then use to draw some sort of uh, influence or conclusion from the work. And in my case, I normally work by comparing certain similar products at the same time, but not everybody does. <coughs> so, what do we have to consider when they do this? Well, obviously we've got to consider the food and drink product we're working with. We need to think who the people are we're working with. What sort of environment, and also what sort of methodology. And you can see one of the characters there is uh, putting out his hair. Because actually, when it comes to deciding what method it is, it can be quite taxing to do that at times. But the applications of this are really quite uh, useful to us because we can look at new products. And again, in my case, typically in developing countries, but not only even seen in mince pies. And we can look at product improvement, more nutritious products. We can look at storage. And we can also relate it to some instrumental method or chemical analysis in some way. So, there's lots of questions coming up this year. There are lots of challenges that face us when we're going to do consumer um, testing in developing countries. And you can see by the pictures at the bottom the sort of environments that we typically <coughs> operate in. Where transport road is difficult, often there's um, no electricity, perhaps no running water. <coughs> so, and again, just matching that, um, sadly, many of our consumers will have minimal education and may only speak local languages. But of course, the thing for us is that um, many of the methods are actually developed in the English language. And so one of the questions we ask ourselves is can we use simpler methods to get around this? And another question is can we actually find ways of using more complex methods? Because the advantage of the more complex methods is we can get more information out of people and do more with it. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we try to look at different test methods in the early days when we were doing this work. Um, and this chart is sort of simple at the top and more complex at the bottom. So the most simple method we could think of for measuring acceptability is to present people with, say, four samples and say, just pick the one that <coughs> most. I think it can get easier than that. So that's what we call the first choice method. We could make it a little bit more difficult by asking people to rank. So you have your four samples again and you rank them from the most liked to the least liked. And lastly, the one that we like to use most, because this is what the international method is, is to use a nine point hedonic scale. Hedonic just means liking. And these scales typically go from 1 to 9, uh, from dislike extremely to like extremely the other end. But as you can see, each of these scales become more complex. So we started off with, uh, I think, 300 or so consumers in Tanzania a few years ago, and we compared our simple first choice method, we just picked the one you like versus ranking. And as you can see on this graph, we actually had a very good correlation between the two methods and the results. Which told us actually that we can at least use that simple method to get good results. But of course, as we got more confidence, we then try more complicated things as one always does. So we thought, well, let's try scales. We wanted to use verbal scales. And what we did in the early days 
would be tried attaching smiley faces to the scales. And um, the funny thing is, the, the faces didn't work because people didn't relate to them. It's I'm assuming to do with culture and, um, and how we're brought up and our expectations in education. But what we did find was that if you verbally explained the scale to people using an enumerator, then people got it, even though they had minimal education and perhaps could not read or write. And, and I suppose, this is, I don't know whether um, it is because if you have middle education, you get used to remembering things, but whatever it is, it works. <coughs> so now I want to give you a few examples, but to give me of our set, before I go down, I want to just quickly explain the outline of our consumer temperature. You can imagine the blue line going horizontally along the top is the food chain, from the farm to processors to the market to the consumers. So what we try to do is look at the acceptance along that food chain. So we looked at um, the wire tool selection, we looked at processing, then we looked at um, the consumers in terms of better nutrition, location, and so forth, mothers and children. And going down is more the socio-economic factors. As I said, mothers and children, and also cross-cultural issues. And um, yeah, it's interesting to see, you know, I'd be interested to see um, what we found and uh, what you might think. So let's start with varietal selection. This is an issue because uh, plant breeders are producing many, many new varieties, in this case, sweet potato. And these have got advantages because of yields and disease resistance and nutrition, but very often they still do not really measure acceptability. And so we're saying, well, actually, taste is important. Um, and we wanted to test this, and we actually used this simple uh, first choice method, just pick the one you like the most. And what we did is we tested, although there's three varieties in the picture, we actually tested about 20 different varieties, by the way. Um, and we, we tested these varieties over a range of locations and over two seasons. So what did we find? Well, we had a taste panel who, are, who were our experts, and they found wide variations in the appearance, taste, odour and texture of these sweet potato varieties. We went to our consumers, I think it was about 600 or so in the end, over that period, who reported a wide variation in acceptance. And then we developed models to map acceptance by location and by year. And this is one of our models. I will now spend the next uh, three hours explaining <laughs> to this in great detail. Actually, I'm not. Um, all I have to say here, we have to look at this model here, is that the blue ones are the varieties that were least preferred, and the red ones were most preferred, and the green ones were outliers. I don't know why we always have outliers in science, but we always seem to do. Um, so what we did, and we found actually that some varieties were consistently preferred, and some were consistently not preferred, there were some in between. And it did seem to depend on location as well. So, going back to our taste panel, we then related acceptance and our taste panel together, because you wouldn't use our taste panel to save a lot of time and effort. And so we come up with a model here. And actually, we only needed to measure, get people to taste for stickiness and um, starch in order to discriminate between the good varieties and the bad ones. But it did leave us with some questions about why some cultivars were consistently preferred and others less preferred, why there were seasonal variations. And so it came to the, we came to the conclusion that really plant breeders need to start thinking about testing their new varieties over several seasons if they can, several different locations. <coughs> so I now want to move on to another topic in sensory science. And this is the one I will talk about in most detail to you. Um, 
and it's also perhaps the one that has had the most impact. And this is um, looking at uh, biofortified sweet potato, uh, or basically sweet potato that contains um, beta carotene or pro vitamin A. Um, and this is important for alleviating vitamin A deficiency. And you can see a picture of the roots there, a nice orange colour, and there's a nice picture of a, of a um, beta carotene molecule to keep our chemists happy. So basically what happens are traditional varieties don't contain any uh, beta carotene, they're white in colour or perhaps yellow. So these new varieties clearly have a benefit. And if you look at sub-Saharan Af Africa, um, vitamin A deficiency is a leading cause of um, <clears throat> deaths or um, tens of thousands of children each year, and a major issue for uh, pregnant and lactating women. And so it's been worked out that we actually can introduce these new varieties. We can potentially uh, benefit from a nutritional point of view from a minor improvement to a significant improvement, up to about 50 million children under the age of six. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the approach. Um, <clears throat> well, we started off with 12 cultivars as a screen, and we found that those varied in colour, aroma, taste and texture. And we also found a relationship between the orange colour of the sweet potatoes and the carotenoid content. This is the orange colour by perception by people. And that's useful to know because there wasn't a relationship. <clears throat> um, it just makes our life a little bit difficult. Interestingly, the relation is actually logarithmic for those of you who it wasn't linear at all. <clears throat> and when it comes to measuring consumer acceptance, we, we, we only selected four cultivars to make our lives simpler and we used a nine-point hedonic scale. And so the question is, how do we analyse the results? Well, we've got four varieties of varying carotenoid content, white, yellow, orange, deep orange. 475 consumers in Uganda, in rural and urban locations. Rural locations are important because that's where most people are vitamin A deficient. What do we want to know? Well, we want to know um, whether the orange varieties are acceptable. We want to know how many people find the orange varieties acceptable. We want to know if there are more urban differences. We also want to know well, what influences acceptance in our consumers. <clears throat> okay, let's get some more results and I'll lead you through how we do this. Well, first of all, we, we looked at the mean values and we used a test, and that's a statistical test called analysis of variance. <coughs> and as you can see from that, the most acceptable, the, the biggest bar, the highest in acceptance is actually the orange one, which is a deep orange, followed by the yellow, followed by an orange variety, followed by a white variety. But actually all of them were acceptable, <coughs> just different degrees of acceptability. But, if I, if I then try and market this or promote it and say, oh, um, the orange variety gets a score of 7.3, people will look at uh, me and think, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, does it? Except the score of 7.3. So we have to look at our data in a different way. And here we're talking about people. And each of these squares is a person. And I've got 100 squares in this case. And um, as you can see, on the right is the, um, the um, hedonic uh, scale we use, and we look for anybody who gave a score of 6 or higher, because that's somebody who likes it. And actually find, out of every 100, 82 gave the sweet potatoes a score, the orange varieties a score of 6 or higher. So we can say 82% of our consumers like our new varieties of sweet potato. This is good news. It means that we're going to make an impact. Because it's a new product to our consumers in Uganda. <clears throat> but then another question comes to us as well. Yeah, I know, but um, what if um, 
we, what we want to really know is whether they find it acceptable, also whether they actually prefer it to the other varieties. Because that also makes it uh, more useful to us. So we need to test that, we use something called cluster analysis, which groups consumers into those with similar preferences. And so we have this chart here, same 100 consumers, but now what we've done, the ones in black are 59 con consumers who actually liked all of the varieties equally. They give high acceptance scores to whether it was um, orange, yellow, or white in colour. It is light. It is light sweet potato. And so what we're going to do, we'll call those they're neutral to adopting the sweet potato. Because although they like the orange one, they also like the other ones as well. <clears throat> Our red consumers are the ones who actually preferred the orange to the yellow to the white. And so those are the ones who are most likely to adopt the sweet potato initially when it's being introduced. They just, they just like it well, this is good stuff. They don't need a reason to um, buy, they don't, they don't need a reason to keep on consuming it. But the grey and the green consumers were ones who didn't like either the orange or the deep orange. And so those are the ones who are less likely to adopt the varieties. And that's also important for us to know. <clears throat> now, another question is, is, well, how many of our consumers actually have acceptance that is related in some way to the carotenoid or uh, beta-carotene content of us? orange sweet potatoes. <clears throat> and we found that only applied to our orange likers, or the ones who prefer the orange. <clears throat> and here's a graph here, which where the vertical axis is acceptability <coughs> and the horizontal <coughs> axis is carotenoid or beta-carotene content. <clears throat> and again, we actually had to use a logarithmic relationship. It wasn't a linear relationship. Okay. And we're, st we're still not yet, because we're still asking even more questions. Um, <clears throat> we want to know what socioeconomic factors would relate to people's acceptance decisions. And you find that the people that are black, ones that highlight in black, the ones who like all of the varieties, remember, <clears throat> we found that those are the ones who consume sweet potato the most. They were farmers, they were less affluent, and least likely to purchase sweet potato in the market i.e. they grow it themselves. <clears throat> and you find that our, our red group where the orange likers actually tended to, not always, but tend to be more affluent and more like to buy from markets. And so now we can think about looking at rural urban differences. Because we wanted to know when you're promoting something, is there a variation in the likelihood of looking at impact? And we actually looked at two urban <coughs> areas, which are on the right of that graph. So um, we're, we're looking at our total number of consumers in the urban areas and the total number of consumers in our rural areas. And if you look at the black areas, which are um, the ones who like them all, they tend to be mostly in the rural areas, i.e. people in the rural areas, rural areas who simply like any variety of potato. And that's no surprise because it's a scam. <coughs> There. But when you look at our urban area, you find there's now more variability in, in acceptance there, and that's because they've got a much um, access to a much wider variety of fruits and probably higher incomes. <clears throat> so in conclusion then on that, we can see that the acceptance of orange is actually much more complex than we originally imagined. But overall, it was very high, 82%. But the thing that we do need to be aware of any nutrition intervention is the 18% who actually don't like our varieties, because they're the ones who probably won't benefit from the nutrition intervention, possibly. I'm not saying they won't, but less likely to, because they don't like it. I want to now just move on to another topic which is uh, looking at mothers and children and from now on I'm not going to go into so much detail again so um, I'm just summarising now um, 
We wanted to look at the acceptance of the old sweet potatoes um, by mothers who've got preschool aged children and school children. Important because mothers influence the diets of children in early childhood and later life, and schools are a great way of introducing a crop uh, to people and especially because they're more nutritious food. And so again, we looked at it four varieties of varying vitamin A content, and this is in Tanzania. So here's a picture of our school children testing it, and, uh, and there's a mother testing the product as well. So 94 children, 59 mothers, smaller sample. What we find here in this graph is on the left-hand side, you can see the acceptance which is in the vertical axis is actually the children as much, tend, tend a little bit less than the mothers. They all liked it, just the children were actually had it less acceptable than mothers, which actually quite su surprised me. I, I thought it would be a different way around, knowing children. And when you divide them up into their behaviour characteristics, like whether they're an all liker or a white liker or an orange liker, we again find that the mothers were generally all likers, but the children actually had a much higher proportion of, of purely orange likers or purely white likers in their trends. So in a, in a way, in a sense, the children seem to be a bit more discriminating. Um, so one of the questions I think we would probably ask ourselves is whether we need to do more studies with children to try and understand their acceptance decisions in relation to um, adults. I think that would be quite interesting because they're the ones you can reach early on in life and make an impact later on. So I now want to change the topic again and want to look a bit more at location and gender differences. This is another question I've got asked by a few people. Um, and, and for this example, again, this is with the Department for International Development. By the way, the last piece of research was actually funded by Harvest Plus. Um, so, sorry to Harvest Plus for not mentioning you. Um, and this we did in Ghana with 300 consumers, and we looked in three different cities in Ghana, looking at um, rice, which is local and imported. We, we were doing this because we wanted to try and improve the quality of the local rice to reduce the reliance on imported commodities and hence help from an exchange. What we find, of course, is the imported varieties are more preferred. But acceptability, interestingly, wasn't, it, wasn't affected by ethnic group or age or gender. And I think that's because most people are very familiar with rice. But there was a difference with location. There wasn't a big difference, it was a small difference, with consumers tending to prefer the rice that came from their own area or, or one, the one that was sold in their own area. And that's interesting, but it just shows you how people do have a sort of memory effect. And when we divide people into groups, we found again um, differing perceptions. <coughs> and again, on the same topic, I want to now look at another product that's interesting, which is um, I've picked it because it's a contrast to rice. Rice is a very bland product. I'm now picking a very strong tasting fermented product or cassava product called fufu. Um, cassava, by the way, is a tropical root crop. And here we interviewed 300 consumers in Nigeria, in Lagos, Abiyakuta, and Ibarba. And there's a picture of our fufu, there's a flower in this case, and that's a typical environment where we did our work. And what we found here was actually there were quite big differences um, in the socioeconomic relationships with the uh, fufu products or the, or the fermented cassava. And that, I think that's because of the very strong tasting product. But also when we relate it to the sensory attributes, you find they're not linear relationships anymore. So a lot of the scientists who blame, blindly just go and plot it do an analysis um, without plotting the graph are going to miss these things. So please, for those of you who just can do, um, just go and just press the button on the computer, do your statistical analysis, please go and look at the graph. 
before you do something. And in this case, you can see there's an optimum texture that they prefer. And also we have one for soundness as well. And so what we found here actually was acceptable. If you didn't differ with location, there was a difference of age, gender, and frequency of eating. Um, and also the acceptance wasn't um, uniform. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm coming to the last of my examples, just some pure acceptance here. But this one's an interesting one, and it's funded by the European Union, and we're still doing the research. But I thought it would be um, very interesting to show you. This was interesting because we wanted to introduce traditional African foods into European markets and obviously the advantage of that is you give people increased uh, incomes. Okay, so our traditional foods, uh, they, they can reach international markets in Europe. Um, we think there's a gap there if people like the products. <coughs> But consumer acceptance is important so that we can get some idea. So what were our test products? I've deliberately chosen three test products which are quite contrasting to each other and you'll see why. One of them is a, um, a drink. Um, that's not Guinness, by the way. Um, it's, a, it's a bright red hibiscus drink, um, commonly sold in Senegal called Bissap. And it's made from an infusion from the calyx, it's like a tea, in fact the tea is also an infusion, but they sell it as a juice and also as a syrup. <clears throat> Another product I wanted to compare with our um, African and non-African consumers was a fermented food called kenki, which is commonly sold in Ghana. It's a stiff fermented paste with like very sort of solid mashed potato and that texture made from fermented maize. And the other one was actually, again, this fermented maize product, but this is much more fluid, it's like a yoghurt. And they'll often mix it with um, milk and sugar, but again, it's a fermented maize product. The advantage of fermentation is you have to prolong the shelf life. <clears throat> so again, just to remind you here, what's different is we're actually interviewing, uh, we're trying to aim for about 100 consumers, in Afri African consumers, and then each country, by looking at the um, European and non-European people who are visiting, we interview those as well in situ in each country. <clears throat> and that's Senegal, Benin, and Ghana. So what did we find? Well, with our hibiscus drinks, we actually found that the acceptance profiles were remarkably similar. And as you can see on these charts here, again, it's the percentage of consumers um, and the vertical axis. And so you can find that there are three groups, the ones who like both the juices and the syrups, we are talking juices and infusion. Um, then we had juice likers and then we had syrup likers. But actually overall the, the trends are very similar and believe it or not, although it looks different, there was not no, no statistical difference there. So what does that tell us? Well, in both groups, the consumption and familiarity of the drink was high. But that was the only similarity. After that, both looked at our African and non-African consumers, they purchased it in different forms and in different places. And you can see in the, in the, in the photographs on the right, the you know, middle one is a market. Uh, where most of our African consumers will buy it, and the bottom picture shows how you buy it in the supermarket, which is our more affluent, tend, tend to be non African consumers. <clears throat> but also, what we find is that when we do a look, look at the chemistry, <coughs> we look at the um, anthocyanins, and the anthocyanins are pigments in plants, which are the nice um, purple pigments you find, for example, in black plants, and also give flowers a nice colour. And so they also present in leaves as well, because they act as a suntan lotion for the um, plants, the leaves to protect it from the waste of sun. It's like a little bit of deviation there. 
But anyway, anthocyanins are these pigments which you find, and they give it a nice red colour. And what you find there is for the people who like the juice, but don't like it, like it nice and dark, but not sweet, we found a relationship between acceptance and the anthocyanin content. But when we go to the people who like the syrups, Although there was no correlation with anthocyanin content, we do get a correlation with acceptance with the sugar content or the reducing sugars. Because for this group, the sweetness is more important and colour is not. So let's have a look at other commodities. Well, I can keep, but I wanted to contrast. Um, as I said, this is a fermented maize product. And as you can see from the graph now, there's quite a big difference between our European, sort of between our, our Ghanaian and non Ghanaian or African and non African consumers. In fact, most of our non Ghanaians, there are very little of the green block or the all likers. Uh, whereas for African consumers, they quite like all of the products which we gave to them. And that's when I um, the white and the Banku products tend to be much less acidic. Well, I think that's a clue. Um, so, what do we find with regard to consumers? Well, um, our non Africans simply don't consume Kenki very much or any product related to it. It's just too different. And again, you look at the form of purchase, again, there were quite significant differences there. And as you can see, there's a picture of the product uh, with some uh, fish in the sauce. And then there's a market, the bigger one is where many of our African consumers would go, one with a nice palm tree taking where the non-African consumers go. But what we find again is that in this case we're looking at um, out of to acceptability, we find that um, for most of our consumers who are African, they have quite a complex perception of taste and it is not a linear relationship. Like the products either um, not very sour or very sour and not in between. But our non-African consumers simply like a product the less, the less sour it is, the more they like it. As you can see by that negative curve there. So that just shows you some of the differences. And when we talk about ac um, the ACPAN, we get a similar result there. And I'm not going to go into that anymore here, but I can say it's very similar to Kenki. It's a fermented product. <clears throat> and so, basically, in conclusion of that one, um, you can see that the um, acceptance, where both, <coughs> where both groups are familiar with the product, have similar acceptance. But where they're not familiar, or one group's not familiar, then we do have different acceptance patterns. And of course, um, regardless of whether they're familiar or not, there are quite big differences in um, how they purchase and consume the product. But nonetheless, though, new market opportunities can be identified. I want to now just finish this, which is very close to finishing. I want to talk about. Um, Another dimension, which is how much you pay. Remember the five pounds earlier? <laughs> um, this um, V shape is basically a measure of significance or contribution to uh, acceptance and purchasing decisions. So at the bottom, I've actually put just the sensory properties or something. Those are like um, the sweetness, the sourness, something like that. Um, we don't have how much it is like the product is more important because that's influenced by culture, location, what you wait as a child and so forth. And probably the biggest contribution to our purchasing decisions is actually our socio-economic status, um, whether the product's available, available ad advertising, ethics, packaging. A good example is, um, I personally find that Aston Martin um, convertible, extremely acceptable. <laughs> but I have a slight problem on this purchasing side. And I think that sort of makes the point. So, let's go and have a look at that one there. Again, this one is funded by Harvest Plus. So again, we looked at um, our 
on sweet potato in Uganda. Um, and also look to what have we give people information about how nutritious it is. And if you don't give people information, we find in summary that actually the prices given by consumers are remarkably the same, the orange and the white and the yellow. But once you give people information, you get an increase in price for the orange, but what we found was actually the increase in price is much greater than we thought it would be, considering people's uh, purchasing power. And so we, we um, went in to try and understand why that is, and we sort of fully understand all the differences, but we looked at, we tried to reduce that by actually asking people to actually part with their own money, as opposed to just giving a hypothetical price. Um, and another example is we looked at um, um, orange maize in Zambia. Again, this is a, a maize, we're all familiar with uh, sweet corn, which is yellow in colour. Well, this is like sweet corn, but almost carrot-like in colour. Um, and what we did there, we again looked at the um, impact of nutrition information, and where we gave them a short monk at the time, and also how we delivered our messages. And again, what you find is that with no information, the amount paid for the orange maize was similar to the um, white maize. But when we uh, gave nutrition information, then we get a big increase in value. Um, but interestingly, again, um, you find that actually the method of delivering the information was very, um, wasn't very important, and, and that was important because the way you deliver a promotion was by radio, or you want to go and uh, work with the community leaders in a village in the rural areas, makes a big difference in cost. Radio is much cheaper. So we found that radio wasn't very, actually didn't have much of an impact on that. But one of the problems we still find hard to overcome in these willingness to pay studies is novelty effect. In the sense that for many people, it's the first time they've seen it and they just want it. And, and how then do you um, counteract that? Okay, we're not going to be very close. Um, impact on development. How am I making an impact? Um, well, with the sweet potato work, um, we did actually manage to encourage some of the markets in Tanzania to reduce the weight of sacks. And importantly, also that had a health benefit for the um, porters. Um, of our acceptance work is now being acknowledged by DFID, that's the Department of uh, International Development, that um, acceptance studies, particularly for the orange sweet potato as a new product, was essential to the product's, project's success. And again, Harvest Plus have reported that for orange maize it was important. And the um, European Union was keen to uh, publish, sorry, to uh, fund the work on acceptance, which we're still ongoing, looking at the acceptance of traditional foods. So what's the future? Um, well, the future is, um, I, I, think, I think we need to continue looking at developing ways of improving the handling and transport of food to reduce waste and loss and food quality. And I think perhaps now uh, well, more sensors we can use, even mobile phones, which can help with that. On consumer acceptance, my own view is I think um, we do need to improve capacity and skill. When I travel around Africa, people just, scientists, they just don't know about these techniques and how to do it. Um, another thing I think that I would like to do is um, look at the issue of follow-up studies. You know, we've done this research but, um, where we predicted what consumers would like, but I've never really had the opportunity to go back afterwards and find out exactly what the effect was and what our models were our models accurate, can we refine them, can we alter consumer behaviour. Very important for the ones who don't like a nutritious product, for example. And perhaps we need to do more about understanding what um, influences behaviour of people, especially low income consumers. 
So what are the overall conclusions? Well, well, I think we've actually carried out research on a wide range of topics. And as you can see, the uh, food chains can be complex. And I have described the acceptance and quality at all of the stages and see how important it can be. You can also see that going back to our topic, our, our title, Let Them Eat Cake, does mean different things to different consumers. Um, but I think this work is important for accessing nutrition, new markets, improving nutrition <coughs> and improving livelihoods. But I do think we have much more to learn and to do in order to continue making an impact. I want to just again now revisit our um, Let Them Eat Cake. It does make sense today, but of course my internet was vilified and she amongst many others um, suffered um, a rather unpleasant fate. However, history like science is not always straightforward. Um, there, there is um, obviously the fact that it was brioche and not cake, and brioche is actually a type of bread. Um, <clears throat> and also there's a dispute about whether Marie Antoinette actually said this at all, because when there were famines in France, she would have been rather young at the time. And also, there is some evidence which suggests that actually Marie Antoinette was actually quite sympathetic to the plight of poor people at the time. <clears throat> this is my very last slide. <laughs> and it's acknowledgement. Um, well, of course, there are the donors I'd like to um, acknowledge, and we've mentioned the donors during the lecture. But more personally, I want to really say a great big thank you to all the numerous colleagues I've worked with over the years in the UK and overseas. I mentioned, you can see them there, they're all over the place. But you can't do sort of work on your own. It's always teamwork. Um, and, but there are a few individuals I'd like to mention. There's uh, Professor Mike Clifford. Um, I mentioned him because he's made a, um, a big impact and a small impact. The small impact was that he, the big impact sorry, was actually he was my supervisor as an undergraduate at the University of Surrey. The small impact was that um, um, after I left, I was looking for a job, and the small thing he did was he made a phone call to my parents to say, well, actually, there's this job going at a place called the Tropical Products Institute, <laughs> which is the predecessor of um, NRI. And that small gesture on his part has had a big impact on my career. So thank you very much, Mike. Very much appreciated. So small, small gesture, big impact. Um, there's Professor Andrew Westby I'd like to thank. Uh, sitting at the front there. He's um, been a colleague of mine for many years. He's now the director of the Natural Resources Institute. I've always very much appreciated working with him and his advice and guidance over the years. And just really just talking to him to sound our ideas has always been very helpful to me. So thank you, Andrew. And there are other people. There's um, David Baker, who is, can't be here. He was, he's now signing himself in Spain, retired. He, again, was a man many years ago who introduced me to consumer acceptance and encouraged me to work in this area. He worked at the predecessor of NRI. There's um, Ray Coker, Ken Dewars, and Professor Jerry Bundle. Actually, Ray's actually sitting over there. Um, they're, they're people who've made a big influence on my career in the early days. Um, there were times when I didn't wonder why, in the sense that when, we were, when I was writing my first scientific publications, I would wipe off what's really good um, manuscript, would go to Ray, and it would come back covered in red ink. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, he, 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 he did me a great service at the end because I, he, he, he made, made me understand the standard that we have to um, work to. And of course, lastly, I want to thank my wife Mary who, and um, my sons Alex and Jason um, 
I've been travelling by a lot over the years, so I very much appreciate your putting up with me and your support. And perhaps as a father, I'm not always being around as much as I should have been, but I'm trying my very best. And so on that note, uh, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Yeah, please come and share some food uh, and drink with us now. 